origins of the P-59 can be traced directly to the British jet plane programs and their Gloucester E-2939 jet plane that used the Whittle jet engine that was designed by Frank Whittle. Frank Whittle patented his turbojet engine around 1932 but wasn't it wasn't finally tested full scale until around 1937. By 1939 the British Air Ministry actually had become curious enough that they placed a contract for the W1 engine to be flight tested on the new Gloucester E2839 aircraft. The Gloucester E2839 powered by the Whittle W1 turbojet engine officially made its first flight on May the 15th 1941 but a month earlier Major General Hap Arnold from the United States had actually visited Britain and was shown the Gloucester aircraft and its Whittle turbojet power plant and he was immediately impressed by the aircraft this is how superior it was to piston driven aircraft I mean he, he recognized that this is the future so he made arrangements to have the designs and plans of the Whittle engine its accompanying technology sent to the United States and more specifically the General Electric engineers from Whittle's company also came over with HAP GE used the design and concepts of the Whittle W2B which is a little bit more improved version of the W1 to build the GE IA turbojet engine. It was the first American jet engine and it was tested on April the 18th, 1942. Interestingly enough, it was only 28 weeks after GE tested it that it was actually built and going. So that's insane. It's hard to even imagine that nowadays, a turnaround that quick. The, the IA engine was developed under utmost secrecy. It was actually sort of like a black ops program by a small team of engineers at a facility in Lynn, Massachusetts beginning in October of 1941. Interestingly enough though, the actual production of the IA's parts the, the parts of the engine took place openly out on the shop floor but they had changed the name on the drawings they referred to it as the type 1 supercharger so literally these top secret engine parts were being developed right along normal production parts and no one knew anything else about it it was hidden in plain sight the two GE IA engines that ultimately powered the XP 59A produced 1250 pounds of thrust each which is funny because if you contrast that with say the F-15 Eagle Pratt & Whitney F-100 engines that produce 14,590 pounds of thrust each, you kind of quickly get brought back down to reality and remember how primitive these early jet engines actually were. So about the same time that the GE team was actually building the jet engine, a team of engineers at Bell Aircraft Company were busy constructing what would be the aircraft the engine would actually power. After Hap Arnold acquired the Whittle engine and had begun the GE program, he called Lawrence Bell to Washington DC on August the 28th, 1941, Larry Bell accepted the contract and immediately put together a team of engineers to work on the project, which was called Model 27 inside the company. The program to build this jet was every bit as secret as the Manhattan Project or the later Skunk Works development programs at Lockheed. It was absolutely under wraps. The plane was described as radical, but if you really look at it, the only thing radical about it is that it was a jet. In all reality, it was pretty much a propeller-driven plane that had a jet engine retrofitted inside of it. The new jet design was a on January 9, 1942, and construction began in March of 1942 on three XP-59A prototypes. Absolute secrecy was required on the project, so the operations were moved to a former automobile factory in downtown Buffalo, New York. One of the reasons for this location was it was relatively close to G plant in Massachusetts, so whenever the engines were ready, they wouldn't have to transport them too far. The building windows were actually welded shut, and they were all painted black, and they put armed security around the clock at all the entrances. The first GE jet engine arrived arrived at the plant on August the 4th and the first XP-59A was ready for shipment on September the 10th. To get the planes out of the building they actually had to cut a hole in the wall. The planes were actually built on the second floor of this building to get them off of ground level but they had to cut a hole in the wall and then they lifted the planes that had been crated up out into a flatbed rail car and then they were concerned about the GE jet engines getting damaged and shipping from shock load inside the turbine so what they did is they actually figured out a way to build a pressed air system and that was used to gently spin the engine while they were being shipped out to the testing grounds out in Merrick Air Force Base in California. The plane was shipped to Merrick Air Force Base, which is now actually Edwards Air Force Base. It was riddled with issues. It did not fly very well. There was bad aerodynamics. The engines actually weren't that powerful, and they had a horrible response. The guise of secrecy was still very strong out there. They actually built a fake propeller to put on the front of the plane to make it look like a normal plane.
plane when it was just sitting around. They constantly layered sheets all over the plane to disguise the intakes, and so you couldn't get a whole lot of information about how it was propelled. Even though the, the performance of the XP-59A was pretty bad, it actually did set a new altitude record of 47,600 feet, which is pretty high up there. On March the 26th, 1943, there was 13 pre-production YP-59As that were ordered. These actually had a little bit better engine in them. Instead of 1,250 pounds thrust, they actually put out 2,000. But the extra power actually didn't really help the plane that much. The top speed of the aircraft only went up about 5 miles per hour. I think it was like 465 miles per hour. The GE engines were also remarkably heavy, apparently, in comparison, especially to their power output. And the exhaust area would get so hot that the turbine blades were actually becoming brittle and breaking off, which would completely just nuke the engine every time that would happen. The third YP-59B produced was sent to the Royal Air Force in exchange for the, the first Glaster Meteor that they produced. The British pilots completely hated the YP-59 and found it wasn't anywhere close to the performance of the Meteor, and it definitely didn't handle it as well. The YP-59A was only flown 11 times before it was returned to the States. On March 11, 1944, a contract for 100 P-59As was signed with a further 250 planned for. However, that contract was actually canceled on October 30, 1943, after only 39 planes were delivered. The Air Force had been testing the P-59 against propeller planes out at Merck Air Force Base, and it was found that the planes like the P-38, the P-47, basically older propeller planes, and later a captured Japanese Zero, all outperformed the P-59 in most aspects. Most of the P-59s went to America to the 412th Fighter Group, but unlike the planes it was kind of in direct competition with, like the Measure Smith ME-262 or the Glaster Meteor, the P-59 actually proved to not be really useful for much. It was only used as a training plane and was never actually put into wartime service. Even though it turned out to be mostly a complete failure, the process of actually building jets and keeping them secret and developing that process of engineering and getting teams together that were used to building jet engines, that's very valuable. And another reason P-59 was canceled was because in June of 1943, Hap Arnold actually had called Lockheed and got them to build the P-80, which ended up being a pretty good plane. Our actual first real service time jet fighter that he was pushing the service. After it was all said and done the p-59 didn't really contribute anything to historical wartime action it was never even used in service even though it was developed midway through the war they actually offered bell to try to produce a b version a p-59b of the jet and they actually gave some suggestions like a single jet engine but bell turned down the proposal and i'm assuming that the defense department or hap arnold or whoever was controlling things just decided just to run with lockheed and develop like i said what was going to end up being the p-80 shooting star it was served all the way through the Korean War before they finally were replaced by the F-86 Sabres, which turned out to be one of the greatest dogfighters of all time. But without the P-59, none of that would have existed. It was a great research and development program to help kickstart that way of thinking in the U.S. Air Force. So that's pretty much its legacy.